St. Andrews is a smaller rural community, a relatively close-knit community where people like to help each other. There's a, a mix of people here. There are Irish, there are Scottish, there are Dutch people. I think too it's uh, pride. Uh, people have a pride in the community and uh, they want to see it be successful and uh, they know that the only way it can be is for everybody to work together. Yeah, pitching in to help the neighbor. It's this ability to help each other to accomplish something. Just, it's a, just a great place to live. My colleague Allison Matthew and I decided to include the story of St. Andrews in a collection of 13 case studies from around the world of communities that have been very successful at initiating and driving their own development. It's perhaps a little ironic that, uh, that we were scouring the world for these cases and managed to find one of the more interesting ones not more than 10 kilometers down the road in St. Andrews. In a really interesting way, I think St. Andrews is leading the way in looking to find a new balance between what governments do and what communities do. St. Andrews has managed to chart its own course where they've managed to be at the forefront of, of, of planning and initiating development in their community. Here we are at St. Andrews Volunteer Fire Department. This was built in 78, I think it was, that they constructed this building, and we've had a very active volunteer fire department ever since. I would say St. Andrews is a smaller rural community outside of a town of about 10,000. Uh, the community itself in the, and the surrounding areas is about 1,100 people. We have a full service financial institution. We have a school to up to grade six. We have a, the largest community center in the area. We have a curling rink. We have an active volunteer fire department. Uh, we have a number of ball fields and a soccer field. We have a community store, uh, a post office, uh, a church, and uh, a lot of good people. So the story really begins in the early 1800s when a few families arrived from the highland part of Scotland, really driven out of Scotland by economic conditions there and arriving with really nothing. And the first uh, couple of decades really were about just carving their homes and farms out of the bush. As we move towards the middle of the 1800s, the community really banded together to build some of the basic institutions and infrastructure. So the church, the, uh, the basic businesses, that formed the backbone of the local economy and of course roads. In the later part of the, of the 19th century, around 1880 to 1930 or so, it was a period known as the Long Depression in which demand for agricultural products and forest products really dropped off. Old farms, they were dying out, you know, and they weren't making much of a living on them and the younger people would move away like to the States or something like that, you know. And they sent a lot of their people, their young people, down to the northeast U.S. And, and even into the western part of Canada to earn money and send it back. They also revolutionized agriculture, led by one of their native sons, Dr. Hugh McPherson, who was the first recognized uh, agricultural scientist in the eastern part of Canada. Dr. Hugh, he came from Fraser's Mills. Oh, he was all the time getting the farmers trying to improve, like, their livestock. And I know all the farming activities. It's he that started the 4-H started in Heatherton. 4-H is the premier youth organization in, well, in this province. It's the most well-respected and longest-running organization in Canada, and it's got about 7 million members in 80 countries over the entire world. The 4-H's are head, heart, health and hands. It teaches young people about loyalty and community involvement and volunteerism, public speaking and confidence, and you learn how to work with a team and get the best out of people. It really creates well-rounded adults who are confident and able to go out into the world and help their community grow. And they're willing to work with people and develop their communities instead of waiting for the government to do it for them.
my father was like at the co-op store here. He was manager at the co-op for 32 years. And uh, so he was like a little involved in all this, what was going on. Well, they used to have kitchen meetings. That's how they got going, like in the, in the communities. They had kitchen meetings. Well, it would be like how to improve your way of life, how to improve your farms, how to improve the land and everything that goes with the agricultural business. You know, just getting the cooperation working in the places. In the middle part of the last century, one of the biggest shifts that occurred in the community was, was the influx of Dutch families. They came to Canada and uh, really revolutionized the, the, the agricultural sec sector a second time, this time by really building up a new and improved dairy sector to really what has become the backbone of the, of the rural economy here today. We were the first ones of the Westlings came a couple of days after us. My husband, he wanted to farm and in Holland there were no farmers. All the farmers here were old, old people and the farms were really going to nothing. And that's why they wanted young farmers in that place, I guess. Work, 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 that's all we did. <laughs> yeah, we worked. I helped on the farm as much as I could and slowly. Every year we bought another cow. Every year we got another baby. <laughs> so that's very slow. <laughs> Here we are at St. Andrew's Credit Union, and this is part of the Burgeon Green Credit Union that's in Anikinish, and the credit union has been very strong in St. Andrew's for as long as I can remember. In the last 30 or 40 years, the uh, community has really undertaken a new uh, refurbishing of their community infrastructure. Well, in 93, they uh, started at the community center here. We did have a parish hall. The parish uh, took a vote and decided to make it a community center. It's uh, run by a board of directors. And again, it was built pretty well all volunteer another help. another gallon of windshield washer from Macmillan's. We had to... tremendous help from business people in the area donating their time. Ralph McIntosh. And their equipment and uh, the people themselves working and so in 1993, it was open in the fall of 1993. What's important about St. Andrews from a historical point of view is that it has gone through periods of struggle and crisis, uh, in many ways very similar to what uh, communities in low-income countries are experiencing uh, at the present time. So during these periods of struggle and crisis, people had to organize in, in St. Andrews just to survive. And then later they had to organize to sustain the relative level of prosperity that they had worked so hard to achieve. And during all of this, I think what's uh, really telling about St. Andrews is that that sense of needing to rely on one another, needing to commit themselves to building and strengthening a community, uh, that's what has endured in, in, in St. Andrews and it's very powerful. I think for the last 150, 200 years, this community has innovated to get around obstacles or to realize opportunity. So when electricity first came to the Anaganish, uh, town of Anaganish, but it wasn't going to be coming to St. Andrews, the community mobilized and they organized work crews and they ran the poles and ran the wires out to the community. It was the same thing when the telephone service came. And actually an interesting innovation that they, they developed in addition to running the lines was they built a house for the operator so that they could afford to have an operator uh, run the phone system. When they wanted to have running water, they didn't wait for anybody to do it. They ran a very complex uh, pump system to pump water uphill from the South River to the community through a system of wooden pipes. Okay, here we are at the Highlander Curling Club, built back in 1991, and about 90% of the work was done with volunteers. The earliest large project that we built in our community was the curling rink. At that time, there was uh, really nobody uh, that curled in this community, none of the organizers that did it, and we were looking for a winter sport where people of all ages could uh, participate. 
The only way that we could build the curling club, which didn't have one penny of any government money in it, it was 100% uh, built by community people and about 95% of the labor was all people on volunteer time. So when the curling rink was built, um, rather than go around and just raise money the traditional way that communities fundraise, they managed to uh, offer shares in, in the building and in the business, really, of the curling rink. And they managed to raise almost all their capital this way. When we see strong communities, we see communities that are able to organize. It's what is called sometimes the software of development. And St Andrews is very successful in terms of its organizing capacity. And uh, moreover, what St Andrews has been able to do is uh, change the way it organizes itself. It's been able to innovate in terms of the way it organizes, as well as innovate technically or economically. The innovation in terms of social organizing is, is very, very important. Is, is 10 feet. Yeah. Okay, here we are at the St. Andrews Seniors Housing Association building. It's an eight unit seniors building with yep. eight residents living in here now. And this was completed a, a year ago. And right now, in behind the building, they're working on phase two, where we're putting up another eight unit. There won't be a minute to pay these guys. Most of them are local farmers that have all put up trusses before, so they know what they're doing. And there's a couple of carpenters up there, but today, being Saturday, everybody up there is volunteering their time to get this done. I remember one of the informal leaders in the community, Leroy McKecker, saying to me that the real secret to leadership is to get people in the community involved in making decisions and building ownership in, in the various projects that the community undertakes. The example he used was uh, to get people to choose the color of siding on the side of the curling rink or the kind of, kind of shingles that they would use in the community center. He said, I don't care what kind of color of siding we use or what type of shingles we use. But one thing's for certain, 10 years later when that person's driving some new family members that are visiting around the community, and drive it, they'll drive up to the community center and say, I picked out those shingles. Now that's the kind of ownership that he's seeking to achieve, and I think that they're really onto something here. <laughs> We're good. We're good. <laughs> okay, uh, with us here on Saturday, January 10th is Jason Van Vondren. Jason is Basically, we called people, told them that we're planning on building a facility. If today. you want it built, uh, the only way we can do it is with volunteers. And we'd appreciate you come when you can. The there were some days that we had yeah, upwards of 40 to 50 people working here. They just came and uh, we would have a barbecue at dinner time and then sit around for an hour afterwards and chat. <laughs> Okay, you've heard the motion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary mind, nay. Motion carried. So it's going to look good, it just says. It's leadership that makes it happen. Leadership is what motivates people to take action. And again, St. Andrews has much to teach us in, in this respect. And when we talk about leadership, we're not talking about the single charismatic Sorry. leader, the take charge personality. In fact, St. Andrews is a really good example of dispersed leadership where many different people come forward to contribute. Typically leaders in that context are connectors. They work in the background linking people who might be able to contribute something towards a community effort. So we're looking to break the two buildings down. There are people who are natural leaders, but yet would never consider themselves as leaders. They're just keenly interested in something, and interested enough to take the bull by the horns and say, let's do something about it. And I, I, I certainly don't consider myself a community leader, but if I get something going that I believe in and that I'm able to commit some time to, I'm quite willing to go at it. And, I think there's a lot of people like that, and we probably haven't even met the half of them. In every society in the world, there are different, different expectations with regard to what the state should provide its citizens in the way of rights and entitlements. In Canada, in a post-war period, we've seen these expectations grow to the point where we expect the various levels of government to provide all manner of infrastructure and services. People at the community level have often ceased to act as citizens 
meaning that they're actively engaged in community life and have tended to become much more like clients, relying on government for a vast variety of, of services. In fact, re relying on government for a lot of the things they used to do for themselves. In St. Andrews, you see something different. Here, the community is the ones deciding what they should be doing for themselves and what they should be expecting from government. So when they decided, for example, to build a curling rink, a fire hall, and a community center, they felt they could do that themselves. They had the labor, they had the materials, they had the skills, and they raised the money internally in order to do that. But when it came time to build the seniors' housing complex, they realized that they couldn't do it alone, that they couldn't do it in a way that would be affordable for some of the elderly people who are moving out of their homes and looking for smaller places to be able to afford. You know, you can't be depending on government to come up with the money for a particular thing. So I think you have to come up with a bit of a creative and innovative proposal. And uh, I mean, really, the projects, the curling rink and, and, the, and the seniors housing associations have been very unique proposals. Uh, the proposal that we put together for the provincial and the federal government for their seniors housing program was considered unique in Canada by Central Mortgage and Housing Corporation. So they brought government in as a partner, someone who could subsidize the overall construction costs in order to get those rents down. What was significant about this for me is that it was the community that was initiating uh, and deciding what it is they want to do, what they should do, and what government should do. Government officials actually find this very refreshing and liberating. Interestingly enough, in, in more recent conversation I had with them, described the St. Andrews Senior Housing Project as the poster child of affordable seniors housing in Atlantic Canada. What we also learned about St. Andrews was the sense of pride that uh, is evident in the telling of stories, stories of success that have accumulated over the generations. When you talk to people in St. Andrews, they are enormously proud of their achievement. And it's this pride uh, that has built up around those achievements that is the motivation for them to carry on. Another thing that has to be taken into consideration is the importance of faith. Now I'm not talking about institutionalized religions necessarily, but what we found in all these successful citizen-driven communities that we looked at in this collection, they all drew upon a well-articulated set of principles and values such as responsibility to others, inclusiveness, caring, sharing, generosity. All of these things were extremely important in terms of uh, promoting a strong sense of community and inspiring leadership to take initiative with other members of their community. I can remember Father Bernie Chisholm one Sunday morning. It was a very wet summer and farmers were having a hard time making hay and I can remember Father Bernie saying if you see anybody out there today making hay, for God's sakes, get out there and help them. The priests did, in uh, other years, take a very active role. Then uh, the parish councils came into effect and it brought more people into uh, the running of the church. And the, uh, so I think it spread it out and maybe helped a lot with this volunteering as well. Because rather than just the priests saying this is what's going to be done, there were a group of people, you know, spread out through the community. The Wishing Well project that has been organized uh, through Mary Vanden Heuvel uh, is a really good example of how St. Andrews has, as a community, reached out to people in very faraway places. In this case, uh, they have organized to raise funds so that uh, a drinking water supply can be guaranteed for a number of communities in imagine? India. Uh, and this effort was meant as a one-time thing, but it was so, so successful. And uh, from that, we have uh, seven wells in India. So leaders happen by example. In, in my own uh, family, my parents uh, and other adults in, in our lives were very active in the community and in the church. Um, in the early days, my parents were involved in the credit union and co-op and in our family anyway, we were taught to learn to share ourselves 
and our time. Here we are at Cayley Ridge in St. Andrews, which is a new subdivision that's developed in St. Andrews in the last four or five years. And it's grown very quickly for a rural community. And I personally have the feeling that a lot of these people are drawn here by the fact that they've heard St. Andrews is a spirited community and they want to be part of it. I recently found out about a new curling rink in a community of Pugwash, Nova Scotia. A delegation from the community of Pugwash heard about what happened in St. Andrews. They came up to the community, they learned about how the community built the rink, and they went back and did exactly the same thing. So I think it's really quite interesting that St. Andrews, in pursuing the path they are pursuing, are in fact leading by example. They're becoming a model that other communities are starting to emulate. They're showing the way that communities can lead, can initiate, and can drive their own development. It's a belief in the people in your community and a belief in yourself. When we decide to do it, it's not a question. If we can do it, it's a question when we're going to do it. But I'm hoping as an annual grows that we can keep the spirit going. And if it can be done here, it can be done elsewhere. If uh, St. Andrews is special, it's, it's, it's because of the people. I know the Cody Institute has learned much from the St. Andrews experience. That's why we're including this story in a collection of 13 case studies from around the world, two to be published in late 2008, entitled, From Clients to Citizens, Communities Changing the Course of Their Own Development.